Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's certainly a pleasure to be here and to uh, and to see. I mean, what's what the pleasure is to see how many people are interested in this subject uh, and and uh, are here to really help us think about and make the links between uh, um, uh, an, an environmental good and an economic benefit uh, uh, that is renewable energy that is both uh, uh, good for the good for the uh, ecology and is good for our economy uh, I, I'm glad that uh, dr. Williams mentioned the uh, the speech at the uh, renewable energy fair and that the, the theme uh, the uh, the title I, I've forgotten the title it's up to cities to save the world uh, it's, it sounds a, it sounds a little arrogant doesn't it especially with somebody in the state sitting next to me <laughs> oh, that's um, but but indeed if you if you think about it um, and, and The Bush administration has abandoned the Kyoto Protocols. Um, one of the early things that uh, President Bush did was to uh, was to abandon that that effort. Uh, Kyoto Protocols are the greenhouse gas emission principles that nations of the world have been signing on to. Uh, the United States is uh, is among the worst offenders, and uh, and and certainly is. Uh, uh, one of the one of the few, I think there are only two of the major industrialized nations that have not signed the uh, Kyoto Agreements. Um, so we're 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 out of Kyoto. We've relaxed uh, federal enforcement uh, under this administration uh, for uh, for air quality. We went from the uh, Clean Air Act to the Clear Skies Act, and and it was a uh, uh, as a matter of fact was a, uh, an opportunity to reduce the burden of regulation on, on industry and, and permit uh, greater uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we've, we've established a, a higher tolerance for uh, mercury levels, uh, mercury contamination in uh, air and water. Uh, I, don't, I really don't think it is too much to say that it's up to cities and states uh, to save the world. We're, the, this, folks, this federal government is not going to save the world. Uh, uh, this federal government is, uh, is, uh, is, is simply um, not moving us in the right direction with respect to uh, air quality issues and with respect to uh, um, the, the reduction of uh, and, and uh, toward eventual elimination of greenhouse gases. So. Uh, we're going to have to win this city, this 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 battle, one city at a time. Um, Grand Rapids uh, signed something called the U.S. Conference of Mayors Climate Protection Agreement uh, last a year ago, last July. We were the uh, 168th city. There are now, I believe, it's 311 cities that have that have signed an agreement. Uh, that mirrors in many ways the uh, Kyoto uh, uh, agreements, the Kyoto Protocols, uh, and in which cities commit ourselves to reducing uh, our greenhouse gas emissions by 7% per year. Um, why is that important? Well, uh, Grand Rapids is uh, in, in Kent County is in a, what's called a moderate non-attainment uh, area. Um, for air quality, um, one of the one of the obvious measures of that is uh, respiratory illness. And when we see that Grand Rapids has the uh, highest asthma rate in the state, we know that there's uh, that, that there are some issues around the quality of the air that we're breathing. Uh, uh, we've blamed. Uh, Gary, Indiana, and we blamed uh, Milwaukee uh, uh, for for years, uh, and 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 indeed it's true. There is uh, uh, there are emissions problems, uh, transmission problems of dirty air from across the lake that that uh, affect uh, the quality of our air here. But I'm convinced, and and I and and, and many more all the time with me are convinced that. We simply can't stop there. We've got to take care of our own problem. We've got to clean up our air at home. We've got to do what we can right here in Grand Rapids. So what are we doing? Um, in uh, 
January of 2005, uh, I gave my second State of the City address, an, an annual a public address I, that I give, that, that the mayor of the city gets to give each year. And um, uh, in 2005, the, my focus was on environmental sustainability. Um, in that speech, I said a 20% uh, attainment of, uh, of uh, in, in our municipal power use, 20% uh, by, by renewables uh, by the year 2008. Um, we've been working with Rich Vanderveen at uh, Mackinac Power uh, on a major wind project that uh, Rich will be talking about. We've been working with uh, Kent County on a, on a methane gas uh, collection uh, uh, project uh, using uh, landfill gases and the uh, that that are the result of uh, uh, of uh, uh, that decomposition process that happens in in uh, in dumps and landfills. Um, we uh, we at this point we are quite convinced, uh, absent some a, a couple of regulatory hurdles that we still have to jump, uh, that we are quite convinced that we can achieve that goal of 20 percent by 2008, and uh, and and working on working hard to do it. Um, in uh, in two weeks, I will uh, I'll be going out to uh, Sundance, Utah. Uh, for a reunion of 46 mayors uh, uh, who met in Sundance summer before last to, uh, uh, to, to commit ourselves uh, to working together to uh, improving air quality in this country. Uh, uh, another evidence that, that uh, cities are taking responsibility uh, where the federal government has abandoned that responsibility. Uh, we we will uh, we'll come together and, and report out on, on progress over the, uh, uh, the past uh, two years since we were together last. Um, we'll uh, learn about new ventures that are taking place and we'll commit ourselves to, uh, to, to new projects at the local level. Um, it is, uh, it's, I think it's still true that it's, it's kind of lonely out there uh, on the, uh, in the political arena when you're talking about things like uh, air quality and, uh, uh, and water quality. Uh, there's a, a wonderful cadre of, of environmental supporters, many of you whom I know and who've been wonderfully supportive who are here tonight. Um, but by and large, the public is, is, uh, is coming along uh, a distance behind us, I think, at this point, it's fair to say. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and so uh, bringing a group of mayors like this together to, uh, uh, to support each other, to encourage each other, to learn from one another, uh, I think is a, is a very important piece. Um, I, I, want to, uh, I want to now just take a couple minutes and make the link between, uh, or make a link between renewable energy and, and strong economy, because that's what we're here about today. It's, this is workforce development. Um, and and uh, use a, uh, in doing that, use an illustration of a, a company that we've come to know from the Basque region of Spain, uh, who has identified uh, the Midwest as uh, a, a target location for production uh, of wind generation equipment, uh, wind turbines, or a manufacturer. Um, second, uh, second largest company in, in Spain, uh, uh, and their major competitor is already here in the United States with production facilities in Pennsylvania. Um, they, they did their homework, they, they looked at the wind charts, uh, uh, they, they, uh, they identified uh, uh, the Midwest and in particular uh, the west coast of Michigan as a, a key area where they wanted to locate their facility, uh, production facility, manufacturing facility. Uh, a facility that they they expect to uh, 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 invest uh, between fifty and seventy five million dollars in a production facility that will immediately begin employing one hundred and fifty or more people uh, producing uh, the component parts for uh, for wind turbines. Now they were very clear. They've been here once. Uh, we've sent representatives there. Uh, I'm uh, in January. I'm going to uh, uh, to meet with their president at their headquarters uh, uh, outside of Barcelona. Um, uh, they want to come 
to Michigan. They want to come to Grand Rapids. They want to build this facility here. But they say, we've got to have some reasonable assurance that there's going to be a strong market, that there is, uh, that, that we will, um, uh, that we'll be able to generate, help me if I get my numbers wrong here, Rich, uh, 400 megawatts, is that right, worth of uh, uh, windmill production a year. Windmills that will produce up to 400 uh, megawatts of, of power per year. Um, and, and they're saying, you can't give us that assurance, Grand Rapids, if Michigan doesn't have a renewable portfolio standard. Michigan doesn't have a renewable portfolio standard. If Michigan hasn't said uh, by, by such and such a year, uh, this percentage of our production in the state of Michigan will come from renewable resource uh, energy. Um, and, and that's something that, that a mayor can't do. Uh, that's something that a governor and a legislature have to do. And, and so uh, I've had uh, opportunity to meet with, uh, with Governor Granholm to, to talk about this. We've been lobbying our legislators uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, chairs of the, uh, uh, the appropriate committees at the state level. Uh, we simply need to, to move in this direction. The, uh, I, I th think it's probably both fair to say and obvious to say that the um, opposition to a renewable portfolio standard uh, will come from um, the, the power companies uh, uh, who currently do not have those kind of production facilities, uh, who are heavily invested in a, in a different technology, a coal, a coal burning technology. And so, so uh, uh, having to shift from uh, coal to, uh, to uh, wind or water or sun is going to be a, a, a difficult and expensive venture for, for them. Um, not an easy, not an easy uh, road ahead, but a very important one. Uh, I think that's probably all I need to say for right now. Um, uh, I, you know, the, one of the questions Sarah asked me to address was where do we, where do we go from here? And, and, uh, and I, am, I am convinced that as we begin to develop the, the capacity here for uh, renewable production, as, we, as, we, as, as, as this area, this West Michigan area becomes a center uh, for renewables, um, that we will not only uh, uh, improve our air quality, but, but we're going to begin attracting industry that wants, first of all, industry that wants green power and that wants to, to locate in a place where, uh, in, and in a community uh, that, uh, that is committed to, to renewable energy. Uh, and secondly, we're gonna locate, we're gonna, we're gonna see those, those businesses that are, that are actually in the production, such as the Spanish company that I mentioned, that are in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the green power production business that will be coming here. So, um, I think with that, I'll uh, be quiet and turn it over to Rich for a minute. Is, are you next, Rich? Do you like me to go next? Do that. Well, good evening. I'm Rich Vanderbeek, and I'm going to uh, spend just a few minutes uh, echoing what uh, the mayor has said in terms of the linkage between renewable energy and 21st century jobs. How can we create the basis for young people in this audience and young people across West Michigan to, to get a good job and perhaps uh, pull in some of the skill sets that, that uh, there's a gentleman in the audience from. Uh, the uh, MTech, uh, training bright young people for the future to have competitive businesses that take on the, the business of creating a, a, a cleaner, better world for our, our children. So I, I, uh, this talk I'm, I'm going to call Positioning uh, Michigan for the Future, looking ahead for the next 20 years. We've talked about wind power tonight, but also I want to re remind everybody that renewable energy generally comes from the sun. Solar PV is a way to make electricity harnessing the sun's rays. Heating water with, with, with solar panels also is another way to create a very important uh, form of energy. Here's an enormous array, uh, a 150 megawatt solar power plant uh, be, being constructed in, in uh, California. There's other ways to harness uh, Animal, vegetable, and oh yes, I'm sorry. Animal, vegetable, and uh, 
No. This. Okay. Uh, to harness other forms of waste, uh, including in, in Wisconsin, they've they've been able to uh, uh, tame ducks and uh, make electricity. <laughs> uh, but what we're really talking about is new renewables is energy security. Energy security and energy independence. How many people here think we should be more dependent on the Middle East at this point in our history? <laughs> How many people here would like to see the Midwest replace the Middle East <laughs> as, a, as an energy producer? That the net benefit here could be not only to produce electricity, but to produce hydrogen, biofuels, electric cars, the new plug-in uh, hybrids, that would allow our children and our grandchildren to drive safe, clean cars and trucks without one drop of Middle East oil. This is a, we're talking about a transformative technology that's all about power plants and electricity for our homes and our businesses, but also transforming how we use transportation. Now right now, if you looked at where does the electricity come from, about 68% of Michigan's uh, energy comes from coal, and that's 100% imported to Michigan. We, we make the next 14% with nuclear power, 13% with natural gas. We even build, burn petroleum to make electricity in this state. But less, a little less than 5%, uh, about 2.5% is really renewable power. When Mayor Hartwell talked about a renewable portfolio standard, an RPS, he was talking about a law that simply requires the utilities as they grow new power, and we need new power, to buy new renewable power. It's a law. It ought to be the law. You, the people, have said through our Michigan Constitution, please regulate our utilities and please ensure that we have clean air and clean water. There are articles in our U Michigan Constitution that require a legislature to do that. And they've done a pretty good job, but when it comes to the RPS, they have not done what 21 other states have done, and simply said, as you grow, and we know we're growing about 1 to 2 percent annually, <coughs> we have about 20,000 megawatts installed in terms of power plants in Michigan, so we're going to need an average of 8,000 megawatts in the next 20 years. Should that be more coal plants, more nuclear plants, more natural gas plants? Could it be all three? But what about adding renewables? Can we grow the renewable piece of the pie so that at the end of the day, we create new clean power for Michigan? We'd like to see 4,000 megawatts of new renewables, solar, biomass, bioenergy, wind, and remember, if you have a, a financial portfolio, a retirement plan, and it's 100% in stocks, that's pretty risky. So you always want to balance that with, with a bond or set of uh, instruments in your financial portfolio that pay a long-term flat interest rate. Well, the metaphor here is that like a treasury bill or a bond boosts your financial portfolio performance with that long-term interest rate, Renewable energy provides a long-term firm price. If we put up a wind power project today, we can tell you that it's going to be, say, seven cents per kilowatt hour for 20 years. Because we know what our capital cost is before we build it. We have no fuel, and we have a, a, a very low operating maintenance schedule. So we can actually sign a contract for 20 years and lock in the price for 20 years. And that boosts the generation portfolio performance, and it reduces the risk of emissions, public health problems, and rising volatile fuel costs. So there's a real economic benefit to renewable energy. I'm going to run through the next few slides very quickly. And just to give you a sense of we must understand the true costs of what, we're, what we have in terms of our power plants today. Because if we don't internalize and, and rate base the true costs, then we're really not comparing a competitive uh, basis for new renewables to compete. Fossil fuels, of course, as the mayor has said, uh, add pro problems with global warming through the emission of CO2 or carbon dioxide from the stacks. They, they have sulfur dioxide, which, which uh, creates acidified lakes. 
they, they emit mercury. And we'll talk about that. And global warming. Certainly, we need to think about what effect are we, this generation, 5% of the world's population in the United States, consuming 40% of the resources doing to the world. So as we think about the future, I think it's very important to not only think about acid rain and global warming, but to think about how we have created a different ecosphere through all of the power plants in the United States, particularly in the Midwest, affecting the Northeast. Now mercury, as, as, we, as we know, as, uh, comes from the air, lands at lakes, and creates methylmercury, and there's an a fish advisory in all 10,000 inland lakes in Michigan today. Young women are, ought not to eat the fish, or very much of them, because that could cause brain damage in their offspring. 41% of Michigan's mercury emissions comes from coal burning power plants. And this affects the development of children. And we really ought to be, again, considering all of the effects, public health, economic, and so forth, as we make decisions about how we make power in the future. As the mayor said, we have a problem with pediatric asthma. Pediatric asthma is up in Michigan. If we know that part of the cause is coal burning power plants, we really ought to, to be paying attention to what we're doing with respect to public health, economic development, and reframing the issue. And then back to the Middle East. Perhaps we ought not to be so dependent on foreign and fossil fuels. This is not a recipe for success for, our, for us or the next generation. Instead, we ought to be conserving oil and gas. It's such a valuable resource that we ought not, even if we had as much as we wanted, to simply burn it up as fast as we could go. Because look around the room. Everything that's made of plastic comes from oil and natural gas. Our grandchildren are going to say, you did what? You put this in power plants at 60% efficiency and burn it up as fast as it would go? This is uh, not, again, a recipe for success, nor do we want to be dependent, perhaps, on some of these unfriendly neighborhoods for our, for the, our supply. Wouldn't it be of, of great value to our children and our children's children to not be dependent on one drop of oil imported into this country or even Michigan? So what, what is the real cost of the Gulf War? Well, we can, we can debate that. And I'm, I'm not here to, to cause uh, a political debate tonight. But I'm simply trying to point out that we Americans, we turn the lights on. We spend a lot of money on power. In Michigan, we import about $22 billion a year. Oh, I'm sorry, we spend $22 billion for power, electricity, natural gas, and oil. We export $18 billion. So every day... We're, we're exporting more dollars than we're taking in and making ourselves more dependent. And, and as we know, oil and gas, just, just the, not only the price, but the availability could fall off in a hurry. So, a broad variety of renewables. The good news is we could innovate our way to the 21st century. We could create economic development for our people that really does make us less vulnerable. I think it's, it's critical that as we look at what natural gas prices have done, what oil prices have done, that we free ourselves from dependency on the Middle East and oil. So again, let's, start, let's talk about the good news. Wind power, our business, really is a bargain. We, as I said earlier, we know what our capital costs are. Once, once it's up and running, there's no, there's no fuel, there's no pollution. And if pro properly cited, we could earn the trust and confidence of each local community that we work with. And we will have a, a way for us to begin the progress away from dependency on foreign and fossil fuel and toward a, a cleaner future for our children. Now this is uh, the Traverse City plant. And, uh, I'm sorry, this is our Mackinac City plant. And we've, we've sold this power into the uh, consumer's energy grid, and it was sold at 3.2 cents, now 1.67 cent premium. 
It's been sold out since day one, which means people are responding and saying, we'll pay extra for our power. Thank you, Tom, and others uh, who have done that consistently from day one. You have made a statement as consumers, energy customers, that you want to free yourself from any emissions with respect to how the electricity in your home is just generated. We know that, that there's been a great deal of subsidies and we know that the renewable energy uh, uh, can reset the price of, of oil. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to skip over some of these. So what can you do? Uh, it's already been said, conserve, conserve, conserve. Keep the money in your pocket, the resources in the ground, and the emissions out of the air. Better manage your own utilities at home and at your business. That's fundamental. Number two, you can buy green power. You can demand that your utility provide it. We have given the right to certain utilities to be monopolies. When you turn the lights on, you must send them a check. Therefore, we the people, through our legislators, should demand that a certain amount of our power going forward is new, renewable power. And the only way that's going to happen is if everybody in this room and the constituents across the, the state say, we think this is a good idea. In fact, when the vote comes up, I hope it's not partisan. I hope we get 110 votes in the Michigan House, 38 votes in the Senate, and the governor's signature. Should be unanimous. Now, does Michigan have any wind? Well, this is what's called a wind map. This was done by the National Renewable Energy Lab and uh, AWS True Wind out of Boston, and they took 20 years of wind data and meteorological studies, and they placed them over Michigan. And along the coast, as you can see, the darker colors indicate where the real wind really blows. And so the thumb of Michigan and parts of mid-Michigan, particularly in the north, and interestingly in the southwest and, and around Lansing, really throw off some wind. Obviously the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, we're the 14th windiest state in the country. The other thing we have is transmission lines. These are not road uh, markers, they're transmission lines. And what they show is that Michigan has tremendous amount of, th of 35, 345 kV lines, 138 kV lines, meaning very high, dense, high volume transmission lines to actually move the power. This is important because out in South Dakota and North Dakota, there's no transmission and there's great wind, but you can't move it. So here we have excellent wind and we can move it. We can put it on the grid, and we can serve Michigan, and we can serve states outside of Michigan. So in Mackinac City, we, we uh, helped organize a wind power project. This project went up December 3rd, 2001. So a little less than a month from today, we'll be celebrating our fifth anniversary. And my good wife, Susan, I <laughs> said, now if I told you five years ago that you can't put up another turbine for five, or five more years, would you have done what you've done the last 60 months? And, I, and I, I'm not sure that I would have, but I, I'm here and I'm glad that we did this. These are two 900 kW turbines. They're one mile south of the Mackinac Bridge. How many people have seen them? Mm -hmm. Quite a few of you, most of you. Well, these two turbines have created 12 million kilowatt hours, enough for 300 homes per year, that don't have to have three tons of coal burned per home. These, these turbines stand over this exotic sewer treatment plant of, of Mackinac City. <laughs> they, have, they have been seen by about five million cars and trucks, people driving cars and trucks every year. And they've, they've added some value, we think, to the skyline. And I'm pleased to tell you that we've had unanimous approvals at every step from Emmett County, Mackinac City, and now their economic development program uses the turbines as a symbol of how progressive Mackinac City is, as it re remains the number one tourist, des tourist destination in Michigan. The Mackinac City project, as I said, uh, now, this needs to be updated, has produced 12 million kilowatt hours, and we've offset, as a result, 25 million pounds of carbon dioxide. 100,000 pounds of sulfur dioxide, 35,000 pounds of nitrous oxide, 
mercury, and if you compare the, the, the amount of power to the amount of nuclear waste generated each year by nuclear power plants, 72.6 pounds of high-level radioactive waste, good for 10,000 years, highly toxic, and now stored at 14 places around the Great Lakes uh, at, in nuclear power plants. So we've offset some things. Our, our company, Fred Keller and I, have set a, set a standard of saying we want to be a triple bottom line company, creating financial, social, and natural capital as we develop renewable projects. And we want to be, on top of that, the employer of choice for talented people because this is about creating new jobs for young people. We want to be a, way, a catalyst for creating new jobs and new industry in Michigan. And as John Sarver could tell you, we've, we've had to blaze a lot of trails, uh, creating a zoning ordinance. John Sarver will tell you a bit about uh, our creating a new wind turbine zoning uh, guideline, which was hammered out through our wind working group, working with citizens from across the state. Uh, and we, we had to do this the first time up in Emmett County. Hopefully there's been some lessons learned. Buying the first uh, wind turbines, buying the first leases, hammering out this tariff, getting a power purchase agreement, and then interconnecting the, power, the project to the grid. These are all basic steps that you take. Uh, again, if any of you would like to, a video about this, uh, my son Ben uh, just graduated from Northern Michigan, and uh, the DEQ picked up his uh, video and is going to put it in every middle school this fall uh, as part of the uh, discussion of how does wind work? What's been the value to it? And uh, if we have time later, I, we could put this on and I could show it to you. But if anyone wants a copy, just let me know. So Mackinac City has been, been a success. We've had a lot of fun with it. Uh, but what are the opportunities for, for you and for this country? Well, we've watched wind grow. Again, as the mayor said, this is going on around the world. We need to be part of this. So in, in 1996, there are a little bit less than 2,000 megawatts of wind power in the, in the world. Today there are 60, almost 70,000 megawatts of wind in the world. This is a business that's compounding at 25% annual growth rate and it's continuing to compound. The size of the turbines has gone up dramatically. They've gone from 50 kilowatts in 1980, about 40 cents per kilowatt hour, to a 300 kilowatt turbine by 1990, down to 12 cents. And today, the turbines are about 1.5 megawatts. They're going up in size. So you have less turbines, bigger turbines, more productivity, and the price has actually come down. We're between five and 10 cents per kilowatt hour, depending on the site, depending on the size of the turbine today. Again, very windy out west, but not great transmission. Good, good, uh, tr great transmission in Michigan and good wind sites. In 1999, there was about less than 1,000 megawatts installed in the country. Today, there's more than uh, 10,000 megawatts installed in the U.S. Unfortunately, we're in 18th place. We ought to be in first place. What are the drivers? Well, we're declining wind costs, fuel price certainty, federal and state policies, economic development and energy security. These are things that, that are moving this industry forward. The price of, of, the, of the wind turbines has, has come down just until recently. In 2005, due to the price of steel, cement, labor, the price of a wind turbine has actually jumped. And so we're starting to see some price increase from four to six cents roughly on a really good wind site. Meanwhile, the price of everything else has gone up in terms of building other kinds of power plants. But on, on the average, as the, as the capacity has grown, the price has come down. Now this is a, a vision for the future. The National Renewable Energy Lab out in Golden, Colorado, was asked by President Bush in January of this year, what would it take to create 20%? 20 percent of the entire U.S. energy by wind power. Right, remember, we're less than one percent of the total today. So we'd go from 10,000 megawatts to 350,000 megawatts. We'd go from one turbine every four weeks 
to one every four minutes, we would create many jobs, many important jobs as we grow across the country. In the Midwest alone, there are predicted to be 267,000 new manufacturing jobs if we took this on. Across the country, 2,097,000 new manufacturing jobs. Building the blades, building the towers, building the cells, building the gearboxes, building the electronics. These are going to be aerospace type jobs for the future. These are going to be jobs that bright young people can learn to do and will be a very important part of our future. But it takes a national willpower to get there. Again, let's not dwell on, on, the, on the past too much, but if you look at all the money that we have spent for R&D in the last 60 years, we spent 1.3 billion on wind, we spent 4.4 on solar, 145 billion on nuclear, okay? So is nuclear power really two cents? Haven't, haven't seen a nuclear power plant since 1970. We, we, we in this country could, could embrace advanced nuclear power. Clean up the waste, make sure that future plants don't generate waste, reuse it, could be a very safe source of energy. But you've got to get after the real costs. Solar and wind, what you see is what you get. There's no emissions. It's paid for. So what we're really talking about is protecting prime farmland for future generations, protecting our, our nation's health from an energy security standpoint, from a public health standpoint, from an economic development standpoint, and most importantly, providing new employment opportunities for our grandchildren. Thank you. I've been asked uh, to speak about uh, state energy policy, specifically renewable portfolio standards and uh, some incentives that are available uh, from the federal government and the state government. And I'm going to uh, briefly talk about these things so we have a, a decent amount of time for uh, questions and answers. First, a couple commercials, though. Uh, you probably are getting tired of those uh, commercials on TV, but these will be pretty painless, I think. Uh, one is we have a program called Go Solar uh, Grand Rapids, and it's a program we provided some modest financial support uh, to a group called the Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association. And this association is working with Mayor Hartwell and his staff to make this program available in Grand Rapids. It's, it's a, a modest program. The whole concept, though, is that if we get enough people interested in buying solar systems, uh, the installer who's participating in this program can get a discount and then pass that discount on to uh, uh, the participants in the program. So there has been uh, uh, one or two seminars here in Grand Rapids already. I believe there will be one uh, after the first of the year. Uh, there are federal tax credits, which I'll briefly talk about be, uh, at the end, uh, related to solar power. Uh, but this is another opportunity if, if you want to uh, uh, get involved with renewable energy and, and get it at a, at a better price. Uh, the other commercial is that the state recently uh, uh, started a Green Lodging Michigan program. We're certifying hotels and motels, bed and breakfast as, as green. Those who are doing a good job with their energy efficiency and their waste management and uh, air quality, uh, the variety of things that, that, that make building green. If you consider yourself an echo traveler and you'd like to go to a a facility that is kind of doing the right thing, uh, just uh, do a Google search, uh, uh, Green Lodging Michigan, and it'll come right up and you'll be able to identify the facilities that have been certified by the state. And there's a lot of other information there related to uh, okay. our Green Lodging program. Uh, let me uh, talk about uh, state energy policy, it, it really begins with our own operations. You know, this, the state of Michigan uh, uh, has to kind of put our own house in order first. And, and we've been working on energy management for, for many years, uh, uh, since the 70s really. Uh, but fairly recently, uh, Earth Day 2005, Governor Granholm issued an executive director, directive and gave us another push. 
And basically, she's established a, a goal for all the state agencies that we're going to reduce our, our energy use 10% uh, by 2008. Uh, and we're going to reduce our electric use or use renewable energy sources 20% uh, by 2015. Now the various state departments are kind of scrambling around doing energy audits, identifying what types of projects to do. Uh, they're uh, in starting to implement the projects. Uh, this executive directive also uh, basically mandates us to buy ENERGY STAR products. It uh, basically requires us to buy some hybrid electric vehicles, use biofuels like biodiesel and, and ethanol. And all our new buildings have to be uh, lead, meet lead criteria. Mm -hmm. And lead is basically a green building criteria. Um, so that's, you know, policy kind of starts with your own operations. Uh, but policy also uh, is involved with planning. And, and the state is involved in a major planning effort now uh, called the 21st Century Energy Plan. And, and Rich has been involved and actually a whole bunch of people have been involved in kind of talking about a variety of issues. Uh, it's really an electric plan. And uh, there's some, been some work done uh, earlier which looked at where the, the demand is going to be and what our existing sources are. And uh, we basically have a problem looking down the road with uh, having enough electric generation capacity. So now the issue is, okay, what are we going to do as a state? Now, when the, the state talks about planning, you, you know, we don't run the utilities and we don't come up with a plan to determine where investments are going to be made. When I'm talking about planning, I'm basically talking about uh, the state looking at all the various issues and, and coming up with hopefully some good scenarios and then make it a decision what kind of policies do we have to put in place to get from here to there. And one of those major policies is a renewable portfolio standard. Uh, Chairman Lark, who's the uh, uh, of the Public Service Commission, and he's the one the governor said I want a plan by the end of December. Uh, so that's the plan's coming up pretty soon to the governor's desk. Um, he recently made remarks and said, uh, uh, you know, there's probably going to be three key components to this new plan. One is a 10% renewable portfolio standard. Uh, one is uh, bringing back energy efficiency programs, spending about $100 million a year to improve the electric efficiency of homes and businesses and public institutions. And when we start talking about those sorts of programs, we're talking about putting back in place some incentives and rebates to encourage people to put in more efficient lighting and more efficient motors and, and really kind of push the market on the efficiency side. Um, and he also uh, has indicated he believes that a coal power plant will be needed, but that the clean as possible. Uh, now, when he made these remarks, he reserved the right to change his mind. <laughs> and uh, he made these remarks actually before the draft plan has come out. So uh, he's kind of thrown out what is, uh, what a lot of people are thinking about will be the key elements of this plan. Um, but uh, a plan will come out, everybody will have an opportunity to comment on it, and, and maybe even more important, whatever the, the governor decides is a good plan, almost all of it has to go to the legislature. And so uh, all the people here in the room, uh, really, I'd encourage you to participate in the process of kind of deciding uh, by commenting on the draft plan and, and talking to your legislators about what you think uh, should be our priorities. Uh, let me talk uh, some specifics about this renewable portfolio standard. This is, like Rich has mentioned, and, and the mayor, uh, really the key policy related to renewable energy. Um, it's, it's a mandate on utilities that a certain percentage of the electricity has to come from renewable energy sources by a certain date. Um, it has been suggested by uh, Chairman Lark that 10% is a, is a good goal by 2015. I believe what he meant by that was that we would uh, 
uh, take into account the 3%. We have approximately 3% now, so we'd be looking at an additional 7%. Uh, there's a group, Environment Michigan, who's, who's been trying to get legislators to commit to a 20% goal. There are uh, other folks who are saying the 10% is not realistic. Maybe we can do 7%. Uh, there's a lot of issues related to this RPS thing, and I'll just throw some of them out for you to give some thought to. Uh, one is what should be included as renewable energy resources. It looks like they're going to pick the definition that came out of the Electric Choice Act that was passed back in uh, 2000. It talks about solar and wind and geothermal, uh, biomass, uh, landfill gas. Um, and most of these are, are what you would kind of consider renewables when you think about this sort of uh, policy. Uh, one issue is do we count just the new stuff or, or some of the old stuff? Uh, it looks like people are talking about counting the old stuff but then having a goal uh, like 7% beyond that. Um, one issue is can the utilities count what they already have or does everybody have to do an additional 7%? Uh, does it apply to alternative electric suppliers? These are the folks, the companies that are competing with our utilities. Does it apply to municipal utilities? Municipal utilities aren't regulated by the Public Service Commission. Can we use renewable energy certificates? Renewable energy certificates are a concept where um, we basically separate the electrons from the greenness and we sell the electrons to anybody who would buy them and we sell the greenness to somebody else and, and really this is what's happening at Mackinac Power now is uh, a number of consumers energy customers including myself are really buying renewable energy certificates through consumers energy at this premium price. Well, uh, they're looking at for this RPS that basically utilities can use RECs renewable energy certificates to meet these uh, requirements so they wouldn't necessarily have their own uh, wind generator or solar systems in order to meet this requirement and uh, when we talk about this this is a big issue about should it just be Michigan should it be the Great Lakes should it be the whole country and, and Rich alluded to this before with the uh, one of the proposals from Detroit Edison, um, and that's to me uh, actually an important economic development issue. Um, you know, it's nice to have wind generators in Wisconsin and Minnesota and other states, but uh, we don't really get the economic development benefits, uh, those jobs that uh, can be real significant. The real issue, of course, is how much by when. Um, let me just briefly mention a couple other things related to incentives because uh, a big part of uh, government policy a lot of times is incentives that are provided to businesses and citizens. Um, the governor, uh, Governor Granholm, has committed to a goal of a thousand biofuel pumps by 2008, which has my office really scrambling. Um, We've provided some incentives, about $50,000 so far, in order to encourage service stations to, uh, for, for new pumps and new tanks. You know, we have another $250,000 in the pipeline to kind of push this issue. I just checked this uh, earlier today, how many stations we have out there. There's about 20 stations that provide 85% uh, ethanol and about a similar number that provide uh, a biodiesel. So there's a a long ways to go for that thousand goal. Um, we have a uh, 21st century jobs fund in Michigan and this is an effort to diversify our economy. Uh, this is a two billion dollar ten-year initiative that's targeted at uh, the life sciences, alternative energy, uh, homeland security, advanced autom automotive, uh, so far, uh, there's been one round of grants, $138 million has been given out to uh, 85 awardees. Uh, from my perspective, uh, unfortunately, most of the money has gone to the life sciences and, and advanced auto. I'm, I'm obviously a little biased. Uh, about $9 million has, has gone for alternative energy and uh, hopefully that will increase in, in future rounds. 
Uh, last thing I'll mention related to incentives is that uh, there are federal tax credits available for both efficiency and hybrid electric vehicles and solar systems. I have a brochure that I brought which summarizes the, the basic uh, uh, tax credits that are available. Uh, you can go to our website also, uh, which is the three W's dot Michigan dot gov slash energy office and look under frequently asked questions. Uh, there's a 30% tax credit for solar systems. There's a uh, 500, up to a $500 tax credit for energy efficiency improvements. So, f for example, if you insulate your basement, you can get 10% of that back up to uh, the $500. <coughs> if you decide to uh, put in a high efficiency furnace, 95% efficient, you can get $150. Uh, I best describe these as modest incentives um, because the Energy Policy Act that was passed had some uh, bigger incentives for more traditional uh, energy companies. But uh, having said that, uh, uh, you know, energy efficiency is, is a good investment anyway. And so I encourage everybody to look at the federal tax credits because it may decide, it may encourage you to buy 95% efficient furnace rather than 93 and the, the federal government will help you make up the difference. There's a whole variety of other sorts of tax credits which, you know, I won't go into any specifics. There's micro turbines and fuel cells and uh, commercial building tax deductions. Uh, uh, so th if, if those interest any of you, you know, speak to me after the presentation or go to our website. Uh, uh, I guess the last thing I'll, I'll just mention is, in, in it's, I'm just uh, thinking about some of the previous remarks about uh, bringing a wind manufacturer here to Grand Rapids. Uh, I was in a meeting in uh, Dearborn just last week and it was interesting. There was a Swedish company there called Nordic, uh, Nordic Wind. And they uh, came to Michigan. They're looking for a manufacturer partner, somebody who knows supply chain. They're looking for uh, suppliers. They're real interested in uh, making wind generators somewhere in the United States. They see Michigan as, uh, as being probably a good place to at least to consider. And what I thought interesting was there's about 50 people in the room. Um, and as people introduce themselves, most of them are suppliers for the auto industry. And uh, they were there and said, you know, we'd like to look into diversifying. We're real interested in what you may be interested in doing here at Michigan. And when you think about what's in a wind generator, uh, there's a lot of those parts uh, can easily be made in a state like Michigan. and. Uh, I know those companies uh, last week in Dearborn were, were very interested in what the Nordic okay. Power, the Nordic Wind people had to say. Um, there's some interesting opportunities for the state, and uh, uh, I think the state is doing some things now. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic this 21st century energy plan will move us to the next level with an RPS and energy efficiency programs, but. Uh, I, I have to emphasize, you know, it, it, is, it is definitely not a done deal. Uh, I'm pretty confident the governor will take a lot of what's in the plan and send it to the legislature, and then it's really the process works, you know. If, if citizens think these things are important, uh, a package of bills will be passed. If not, then it'll probably get stalled. Um, I, I, this is time for questions, I guess, huh? or discussion, or I think so, Sarah. So let me first get, let's let me first can tell you what the format will be here, and give you an opportunity to leave if anybody does have to leave at this point. We will be out of here at 8:30, um, as we mentioned early at seven. If you provide the young lady at the table outside the door with a completed survey on the back. This is what we're getting from you. Your thoughts on future sessions, future information, future learning opportunities and renewable energies. So if you provide her with this, she'll give you a get out of the parking lot free pass. All right? right? All right. So you can out to Betsy. Um, hold on just a sec, Mike. We also have, when you leave, there's a couple other 
handouts that are available. Um, these came with John Sarver from, <laughs> from the state on the tax incentives. There's also a website on the wall up here. The, um, <clears throat> the objectives for this evening are also listed here on the wall. And then there's two handouts that Rich provided for us. And one is the benefits of wind power, and one is the myths of wind power. So all these will be on the on the table outside in the um, outside in the hallway when you leave. So now for questions for the rest of the evening, it would probably help class who's doing the who's doing the recording back here if you take the microphone and ask your question. He's um this is being videotaped, and it will be downloadable for you at any point in the future. It might be a week or two before it's there. You can go to grcc.tv or to the huh. GRCC website and click on the sustainability team to find an access or a link to what you saw here in this discussion tonight. So, questions? We'll go here first because it's closest. I have a question uh, for the mayor. Is this on? Is that on, class? Yes. Okay. Um, you mentioned that um, you're part of this initiative, or part of this group of cities who's made a commitment to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 7% a year? 7% per year. Um, I'm interested in hearing um, more specifically what are some of the measures that the city is taking toward that goal? It sounds like a pretty aggressive goal in a short time frame. Well, it is indeed. Um, some things that we've that we've done uh, in the area of, of conservation, uh, uh, the the uh, complete overhaul of our uh, uh, the, the electrical system of our wastewater treatment plant that has that's been able to uh, uh, conserve electricity. To I wish I could remember numbers, but it's a significant reduction in electric power um, uh, utilization. We are we've converted now. All the uh, traffic lights uh, to uh, light emitting diodes, uh, LEDs, and we're, we're through 60% of the uh, street lights uh, at this point on a, on a plan to uh, replace all those with, uh, with LEDs. And the bridge lights are all uh, LEDs now. Um, the, the investment in um, in, in uh, transit uh, is is significant for us here, and the and the uh, the growth of ridership and the uh, and the rapid is uh, is very very important. Uh, uh, getting we're getting people out of their cars and, and into uh, uh, into the into the buses, the mass transit vehicles. We're also uh, well on our way toward uh, a, a now a January submission of uh, to the federal transit. Transit Administration of our plan for a uh, uh, major corridor investment uh, that uh, is looking like a streetcar and uh, fixed corridor, uh, fixed guideway bus uh, system. Um, so would be a, those would be a couple of examples. Um, I see Norman Christopher in the audience. Uh, if you can think of some others that I've forgotten uh, offhand, please. Uh, the, uh, the only comment that I would have is the uh, current status of trying to take actual inventory of the greenhouse gases. That yeah. There is probably six or eight uh, enterprises in the area that now are beginning to get a handle on that and are probably going to come together to uh, develop a, a list of strategies that we can all take. Thanks. Because, because uh, class couldn't uh, pick that up without the microphone, uh, it's, it's a... Uh, it's a question of, of really finding a good way to measure the impact that we're having and, and collecting, getting a, getting a baseline and then collecting that data. One reason to do that, uh, among others, is that we can participate in the uh, um, Chicago Climate Exchange uh, as, as we're able to uh, save, save energy uh, and reduce greenhouse gases. Um, we have a uh, there, there's a market now that's that's those those uh, greenhouse gas emissions are fungible uh, on the Chicago Climate Exchange and so we're we've uh, we've we've visited there we've met with uh, their representatives and uh, and we think that uh, uh, that that's that that uh, uh, is is a payback for the city in effect uh, for good practices it's a it's a win win. A, a partial answer to your question. Thanks. How does this work? 
It's on. It's on? Uh, first, I commend the mayor, because I do really believe the mayors can solve the energy problem. If, if, if you really are on that tack of 20%, you're going a long ways. Secondly, I, uh, John, I I'm, I'm really am, uh, am suspicious that a new coal-fired power plant would be state-of-the-art. I can't imagine Consumers Power getting the money to build that kind of a plant. I, I believe it will emit carbon dioxide and nitrous oxi oxide, sulfur dioxide, and mercury. Uh, and I think it's within our power, and I think, John, it's within your responsibility to see that that power plant does not get built. We, we get it with solar energy, wind energy, it's, it, it's there. Uh, we can get wave energy. Uh, I don't want to see that power plant built. Right now, Grand Rapids, the mayor said, is the worst city in the state with asthma. That coal-fired power plant over there ought to be shut down, and uh, I'd help knock a few bricks out of it. So. <laughs> uh, you need to help us. You need. You, we need all the help we can. I did sign a contract. I am going to put uh, two, 2K. 2K on my house. It'll do about 25%. 25% of my electricity. Now, you can't put it on every house because every house is not positioned quite right. But Mark Bauer did come up and look at three houses. He could put solar on all three of those houses. Now there's problems with, there's actually problems with township ordinances, neighborhood associations, but we need to be smart and we meet, need to be cooperative so that that solar can be put to, uh, put to full use, the wind can be put to full use. I visualize the city of Grand Rapids, Mayor, with solars on many of those buildings, you get some of the new technology with a Stirling engine solar system, which are 10 times more efficient than the PV, uh, PV systems that go to on my house. You do something with the sewage disposal system down here, all that biomass can make a one heck of a lot of methane gas and electricity. Uh, you'd have a, you'd have a self sustaining island here. The energy wouldn't have to be shipped from uh, South Haven, Bridgman down that way, or from uh, Grand Haven, or uh, wherever that other plant. I won't even say it's going to be built. Uh, so this is our local vision. Let me make a couple comments if I can, because uh, I'm, uh, you know, the gentleman asked for my help. Uh, let me kind of uh, turn that around a little. I'd like to ask for all of your help because, uh, you know, I work in the state energy office. The, the, the state public service commission has been. Uh, asked by the governor to put this plan together, which I've indicated eventually will go into the state legislature. Uh, Rich and I and a whole bunch of other people have been participating in this planning process, uh, which includes 150 people. If, if you understand how any planning process works, you, you go to the first meeting and you look around and there's about 90 people from utilities, and then there's Rich Vanderveen and somebody from the Energy Office and somebody from the Michigan Environmental Council, and, uh, and you know this is not unusual for for what happens in in a public process because some people are paid to go to meetings, and if you're a big company, you can pay a lot of people to go to a meeting. And I understand all of you can't take time off from your work to participate in a fairly complicated planning process. Um, I personally, and I'll take my hat off right now as kind of a, a state government employee, find it hard to imagine why we're talking about a coal power plant uh, when we finally seem to have woken up that we have some problems with climate change. Uh, that's, that's my personal opinion. I, I find it amazing, but I wanted everybody to realize when the people are sitting down in Lansing talking about this stuff, that's what they're talking about. And, and the chairman of the Public Service Commission is talking about, yes, we're going to have an RPS. Yes, we're going to have significant efficiency programs. And, you know, it looks like we're going to have to have a coal power plant. Now, 
somebody's going to have to convince some folks that that's not the way to go. Uh, and I can uh, assure you a whole bunch of us in Lansing have been trying to encourage a greater reliance on energy efficiency. One thing that's interesting is uh, early on in the process I heard a presentation from Wall Street person and they basically said, oh, this stuff is too risky. We wouldn't finance nuclear power plants and coal power plants and, you know, this, too much uncertainty. Uh, the, the good news about that is, it got me worried, the good news is almost everybody seemed to think now energy efficiency is a good idea because <laughs> there's no risk to energy efficiency. So we seem to at least to have a, had a consensus on that. But uh, coal gasification we're starting to hear about, uh, is, can you say something about that? Is it a process that has some promise? Is it environmentally safe? And uh, what, what about coal gasification? Well, you know, I, uh, I'm not an expert on coal gasification. I think that's an excellent question, though. Um, I think, and, and there are companies out there right now who are building coal gasification plants, and the federal government is putting money into research. And, you know, I, I believe that we have to look into those options. Uh, we have to look into clean coal. I mean, I don't, I mean, that's my personal uh, opinion. You know, we have to, everything's on the table and we have to look at it. When they uh, were doing the planning process uh, for this 21st century energy plan, it was considered too speculative and, and uh, the costs were too speculative too and the technology to actually have it be part of the plan. So maybe three years from now, it's going to be something that's going to be a viable option. I have the sense that right now it's not considered something that we can really select. And I don't know, Rich, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, well, the, as you say, John, that yeah. uh, coal gasification, IGCC, is under uh, research on uh, prototypes right now. It, evidently it's more expensive, but the idea is to gasify the, the coal and then essentially double burn it so you have very low emissions. And, and that may be acceptable to a broader range of people than, than the, what the typical pulverized coal that, that burns up coal by the truckload or train load today. Uh, if we could uh, put our heads together and come up with an ultra-clean coal plant, some would say facetiously the better cigarette, that, that uh, we really uh, <laughs> could uh, create a basis for, for grounding ourselves in, in better technology. I think the point to remember here is that in our lifetime, we are still going to depend on coal. This is a big battleship. You have to shift it five degrees at a time. And that may take many years. But if we, the decisions we make today, we're going to pay for for the next 50 years, both financially and uh, health-wise and economically. And it's been shown time and again that, that new energy efficiency, innovation, renewable power is a way to innovate our way forward and could actually bring down the need for, for uh, new generation facilities. As we retire the older coal plants, it's guaranteed we will need new baseload in Michigan. And wind, for all its benefits, is not baseload. It's intermittent power as is a lot, lot of renewable power. So we have to figure out how do we keep the lights on 24-7 and be realistic in, in grounding ourselves in technology that provides reliable, low-cost, competitively priced power and adds value from that economic development point of view. Yeah. Yes, I'm a firm believer in uh, alternative forms of energy, and I'm also a firm believer in smart land management. In other words, uh, we talk about biofuels. I'm, I'm all for planting crops that are low maintenance, that don't require pesticides, and that don't require a lot of water. Now, my first, it's a multiple part question I'd like to address to Richard. What is the life expectancy of a, of a wind turbine? <laughs> Essentially, uh, the, the tower itself is probably 100 years, and the nacelle, the gearbox, about 30, and the blade's about 30. So there's a planned, uh, a plan to set aside uh, 
money as we grow forward to create a fund to swap out the gearbox and put on different blades as we, we move on down the line. Okay, the next question would be, you talked about 20% uh, alternative energy, let's say if it came from wind, about how many turbines uh, based on today's capacity would it take to achieve that 20%? About uh, 250,000. Okay. Given your uh, top, uh, topographical chart that you had as far as wind mm -hmm. uh, in certain uh, areas, what type of density, in other words, how many windmills per, let's say, per square mile in the areas that are designated as good wind? Right. Typically, typically there are two to three windmills per square mile because they, you don't want them to wake one another. So you lay them out in a very broad area. And so this does require uh, very careful planning. Uh, in Michigan, as you know, we have 1,800 units of government, 1,250 townships, 600 plus municipals, plus 550 school districts, all of whom have planning capability. So we have an excellent uh, puzzle here to put together, Mayor, in terms of land use planning. You're, you're putting your finger on a very good point, that this has to be done with great care, uh, with baseline studies, as the mayor has alluded to, in terms of, of sound, avians, uh, wildlife issues, uh, setbacks, so that they're, they're away from homes, away from uh, communities, and put in areas where typically we, we lease the land from a broad group of farmers who have been on the land for many generations. So we have the opportunity in certain parts of Michigan and certainly across the country to bring new economic development to rural communities that will accept the wind turbines. There's no question. It, when you're talking about a 350-foot tower, this is a very large impo uh, new way to make energy. They, they can be done, they can be cited poorly or they can be cited very well. And so it takes a long time to build the, the public trust and the confidence, educating the public from the young people to the old people to every, everyone about the, the, all of the realities of what we're doing. And there's no hiding the ball here. It, it, we need to talk about the sound issue, the noise issue, the avian issue. And if we do that well, and we frame the issue as economic development, and we frame the issue as community development, and we, and we think as Americans about some sacrifice, about how all of us have to give some to, in order to compete internationally, in order to become energy independent, in order to create those jobs for our children, and protect the farmland and Great Lakes for our grandchildren, then we, we have this discussion about where they go. So it's not simply we're imposing these, but rather it's a discussion, a collaborative, a thoughtful way to think through the land use issues, which is very difficult in Michigan, particularly when you have six by six mile townships. Well, I think you probably addressed uh, the last question I was going to ask you was on the, uh, the noise level, and I was just curious uh, how many dB or what noise level? Uh, typically the, the, the wind turbines are 55 decibels, at, at the, what range? At, well, the typical setback is one to one and a half uh, times the wind, wind turbine. So if the wind turbine is uh, 300 feet tall, it would be a 900 foot setback. That's a and, and pretty so, good, uh, that's pretty good Well, 55 de you know, decibels are, are cubed. And so uh, 55 decibels is fairly low. It's less than my voice now. It's, it's less than a blue jay. It's less than uh, background noise in an office. It's about uh, like a refrigerator running. It's, it's audible, but again, if it's done well and the machines are maintained well, and you do that baseline study to start with about other noises in the community, then you then have a discussion about what, the, what should be included in the special use permit for the, for the wind farm, then I think you can, you can have a rational, okay. thoughtful, safe discussion about how to plan these. Okay, my next question was going to be for the mayor. This will be the last one. I've been energy conscious and something you may want to include in your presentation since 1997. I reduced the wattage overall in my house just from lighting alone by 60% just by going a more energy efficient solution. And that kind of offsets what you say the additional premium cost for 
wind generation would be actually more than offset the cost by the reduction. Now, Mayor, you had mentioned that you were uh, converting your street, your uh, signals, street signal lights over to LEDs. What's being done as far as the uh, municipal lighting or street lighting? Street lighting. We're at, we're at 60% conversion on street lighting at this point. To uh, what technology? To LED. Okay. The um, uh, we, we're 100% of the of the traffic lights and 60% of the street lights. Okay. Great. Thank you. Should I say something about offshore? Okay. No. I, I think. You had mentioned that there are some policies that are going to be going um, before the legislatures, and I'm, I'm curious, legislators, excuse me, um, and I'm curious, uh, what if any um, net metering policies are going to be considered? Well, we, we, we have net metering in the state right now. Uh, it's, uh, some people don't like to call it net metering. Um, it's, uh, it's not... I have some reason to think it's not working so well. Uh, let me just put it that way. Could you tell us what it is? Good, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, net metering is, a, the original concept of net metering was that for, for small, like homeowners and small businesses, if you had like a photovoltaic system or a small wind generator and you had some excess power, why don't you put it on the grid uh, and it could be used by other people and you just have the meter run backwards. You know, keep it simple. Uh, when the meter runs backward, you're basically getting a credit at the retail rate. And it's very simple, you know, administratively it's simple. Um, of course, we couldn't do that. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I w I'd need about uh, another 40 minutes to kind of go into all the details. You probably don't want to hear all the details anyway. Um, but but we, what happened was the utilities and the commission staff got together and voluntarily agreed to do something, and, and everybody had to compromise. And, and the compromise means that net metering now is good for some folks, depending on your situation. Certainly, I don't recommend it for everybody. And there's no payment from the utility. It's basically, you can put excess power on the, uh, the grid and get a bill credit. And, and again, I could talk for a long time about this, but you probably don't want to hear it all. It can be done now, yes. With all the utilities, uh, all the investor-owned utilities in, in rural co-ops, not the municipal utilities, because they're not regulated. John, I'm Raj Patel. I got a question for you. Is there any state, like a state government of Michigan does have any kind of a energy tax credit to the energy efficiency program used by the customers or whoever use energy saving programs? Like let's say the business does have a, some kind of a lighting or electric motors and they save some energy. Is there any state level energy tax credits available? Not a thing. Uh, the only thing that uh, the state has is basically some uh, uh, tax incentives for like manufacturers to move here and generate uh, produce wind generators. Although uh, what's being talked about now, and I think it's a very, very good possibility, is this energy efficiency program that's part of the, the plan, $100 million a year, and basically that would provide rebates and incentives okay. for commercial lighting projects, high efficiency motors, the, the sort of things that would be covered by tax credits anyway. So I, I personally think it's likely a year from now we'll have those sorts of programs in place. Um, I want to give you the, the blank check. If we really embraced this as a nation, we jumped in with both feet, how fast could we, how, how fast and how far could we go if we really put our mind to it on wind power, wave energy, all of these other things? And along the same lines as you, you were talking about the difference between you know, base load and peak load and all that good stuff. Can we look toward some of the new nuclear solutions that are coming online, the pebble beds and all that good stuff that are mm -hmm. supposed to be safer, more flexible, less wasteful? Do you see a, a good potential with that kind of technology coming along, providing a 
a light green peaking opportunity for you know the real hot days of the year and things like that you know i just i'm so tired of the mercury going in the ecosystem i could just scream every time we get going what what can we do to get there you know, here's the blank check. How do we get wow. there? What, very what are good, we do and how, very do, we, good how do we get there? Uh, I think that's a very thoughtful question and, and it demands uh, some, a lot of, lot of thought. Off the top, I, I want to defer quickly to the mayor, but I, I'm thinking that if we were to, as a nation, think through this as a Marshall Plan or an Apollo Plan, to say we're going to spend as much money as we're spending today on defense, on energy, innovation. And the goal is to be energy independent. How could we do that? How could we start with our K-12 schools, higher education, businesses, labor, environmental groups, churches, stewardship thinking, so we begin to really harness the best possible examples from around the world and where we are going to become leaders on how to get this right. There are great examples in Europe of, what, uh, of how to make ourselves energy independent. There's great examples in Brazil. Brazil is about 75% independent today. There are ways to use animal waste, food waste, vegetable waste. Uh, there, there are all kinds of ways to harness heat that we are not using today. And if we began the goal of being energy depend, independent in the next 25 years, I honestly think we could get to 25% by 2025. Mayor, what do you think? Well, well said. Uh, I, mean, I, I liken it to, uh, to, to uh, President John F. Kennedy saying, in a decade we'll have man on the moon. And, uh, and everybody said, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and, and it happened. Uh, uh, it's it's not going to happen in that dramatic way, unfortunately. By you know, 46, 46 mayors or three hundred and eleven mayors or, or two thousand mayors uh, doing little things in our our communities, important as that is, it is going to take a national will. And and right now we don't have that national will. Uh, mm -hmm. It. Uh, uh, at, at least in the in the, uh, the the halls of Congress and in the White House, uh, I th I think there's a growing will among the people of this country, and the and the sooner the sooner that will coalesces and 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 finds and finds a champion at the national level that can uh, uh, that that can provide the kind of leadership that a JFK did, um, that's when it'll happen. <laughs> We'd like to thank you all for coming. We'd certainly like to thank our three presenters. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. And our intent here tonight was really to start a conversation here at the community college and in, and in our community that takes renewable energy, just takes it a little bit past that conversation about the ecological impact to the economic potential and the economic potential that is there but isn't perhaps something that we see because we don't see it here in West Michigan. If we were in Texas or California or in Germany or Japan, this would be our conversation already. We just aren't seeing it here. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for filling out things. Mike, would you help them out there?